Good evening, friends. Welcoming you to this update session on managing difficult glaucomas in patients with posterior segment pathologies. A course that is very relevant in the present scenario with a number of uh, VR procedures, both medical and surgical, have increased in bulk in our country, in volume in our country, and the number of intravitreal injections that we give have also increased tremendously. We have a very elite faculty. We have presented this in various forums, both, both here and abroad. We will start with neovascular glaucoma. I will give you a brief outline of uh, the course that we are going to take. We'll start with neovascular glaucoma. We have Dr. Arup presenting on that. This will be followed by a talk on uh, post vitrectomy glaucomas by Dr. Sushmita Kaushik, followed by the difficulties in the diagnosis and management of primary open angle glaucomas in uh, patients with high myopia. This will be followed by two talks one by me, one on post-intravitreal injection glaucomas, and second one is acute angle closure glaucoma in patients with massive supracoroidal hemorrhage. I was also told that we have a keynote speaker, Dr. Welcome, Dr. Preeti. Dr. Preeti Paritosh Kamdar, she will be addressing us on understanding angle closure. I invite you to the stage. Please uh, give your lecture. Thank you so much, madam, and uh, good afternoon to everybody. Uh, angle closure is an enigma because of its varied causative factors, clinical presentation, and response to treatment. No two patients respond in the same way. And our understanding of angle closure has improved because of this ability to visualize angle structures and quantify them with ASOCT and UBN. So, what is the basic difference between POAG and PACD? Like normally people think, all right, the angles are closed, and uh, both of them people think are just two separate glaucomas, but the aim in primary open angle glaucoma is to lower the intraocular pressure, but in primary ACD, angle closure disease, our aim is to prevent angle closure, and by preventing angle closure, you prevent the pressure from rising. So in certain, to a certain extent, prime PACG is preventable, POAG is not, okay? So um, another thing, if there are many times when people come to me and say that this patient had mild angle closure, one more thing I want people to understand is that there is no concept of mild angle closure. Whenever you see a patient, you do a gonioscopy, and you, cry, you try to club the patient in one of these three primary angle closure suspect, which means there is only iridotrabecular contact, there are no PAS, there is no glaucomatous uh, neuropathy, and then you do not need to sort of treat, but you just need to follow up. The second is PAC, even a person who has had an acute angle closure attack goes into this criteria of primary angle closure and of course glaucoma is when you have a uh, defect. So this is one more thing which I want you to understand. Whenever you see a patient, you try to classify the patient in one of, uh, of angle closure and then you will know what to do. PACS, observe, PAC, iridotomy, PACG, iridotomy, and treat the person uh, as you would do a POAG. So what are the anatomic risk factors? We all know um, traditionally, you know, small cornea, shallow anterior chamber, thick lens, anterior lens position, short axial lens, all these are anatomic risk factors for developing angle closure, but Everybody does not develop, uh, even nanophthalmic eyes don't always develop angle closure. So we have had certain modalities like the uh, OCT, the AS OCT particularly, which gives all these uh, measurements. And some of these measurements have shown, shown to be 
these patients with these measurements are at a higher risk of developing angle closure. What is the role of the lens? Everything that we know, so one is a more anterior position, then a higher vault. Vault means, uh, in very simple terms, how much it protrudes into the anterior chamber is the, is the vault of the lens, plus the position of the size of the lens. It's a large lens in a small eye, and even the thickness of the lens uh, is, has a role to play in the development of angle closure. What is the role of uvea? Now, this is something which we have been able to elucidate more and more because of using ASOCT, and more of ASOCT and very little of UBM. So one is that when you dilate a pupil, the iris acts like a sponge and sort of squeezes fluid out of the iris. But in a patient who has angle closure, it increases in thickness. So this is one iris volume which is usually, which usually decreases in patients after dilation. Here it increases and thereby crowds the eye further and thereby prones, uh, uh, the person can get an angle closure attack. Then all these other things that in, um, there is differential iris thick, uh, thickening, that the iris which is nearest the ciliary body thickens as age increases. Choroidal expansion is sought to be another very important cause of angle uh, closure. Means choroidal expansion uh, sort of crowds the eye, the iris lens diaphragm is pushed forward, and that is what precipitates an attack of angle closure. So these are the roles which different um, organs inside, organ nails inside the eye play. Now, uh, this is what there are questions which we have always asked. Now, there is this 40-year-old lady who came to me in 2010. I advised the PI because angles were closed. I dilated her in 2012, 2015, nothing happened, not, the pressure did not rise at all. And I, I was worried, I mean, not worried, I was questioning myself that how come I had stopped telling her also about the PI. And in 2016, after I dilated her, the same evening she came with an attack. So I thought six years nothing happened, even though anatomically, gonioscopically, I felt it was the same. There was one more patient with primary angle closure, and I could not complete the iridotomy in one eye. In the other eye, I could do that. But four days after the, um, uh, four days after, uh, the attempt to iridotomy, he developed an acute attack. So what happened that a patient who was otherwise doing very well, why did he have an attack? If I had probably left him alone, he would have been better off. So these are the questions which we ask, and we see two patients, similar closed angles, and they don't develop any attack. So there is this very beautiful diagram which tells you what happens. Now, all these questions can be answered by this diagram, that the genetic makeup of a person decides the structure of the eye, including the cornea, crowded anterior segment, and everything which predisposes a person to angle closure attack. These form the groundwork on which all subsequent factors, when they come into the right proportion, they will precipitate an angle closure attack. So which are these? So it could be the main is aging. When, when a person ages, this lens wall, the lens thick, and the anterior lens position actually comes into a more favorable position where it can precipitate an acute attack. The patient in whom I had an imperforate uh, iridotomy, Probably the iris thickness crowded the angle, and a person who was otherwise asymptomatic developed an attack of angle closure glaucoma. So this is one thing which you have to realize that even though a person may have all the anatomical predispositions, unless other factors come into play, like if he develops a cataract, probably even, even though he has the anatomical groundwork, if he gets operated, he's never going to develop the attack. So this is what is a basic understanding of angle closure glaucoma, why some people develop it and why some people don't. Now, so mechanism of angle closure, pupillary block is the main commonly known uh, mechanism of primary angle closure. It is due to the proximity of the posterior surface of the iris uh, to the lens, which generates an increase in aqueous flow resistance, and we all know what happens after that. However, there are non-pupillary block uh, factors like whatever I said earlier, thick peripheral iris, anteriorly rotated ciliary body, plateau iris configuration, serially blocked. So when you do an iridotomy, you relieve only the pupillary block. 
the rest and however uh, there are studies which have said that half of the primary angle closure in this Chinese patients the study 54.8 was caused by multiple mechanisms so always the patient will not have just one mechanism but of which pupillary block pupillary uh, block is a main mechanism and hence iridotomy should be advised in each patient but however as I have told you earlier, it will address only the pupillary block and response to PI will be determined by the contribution of the pupillary block and the contribution of the other factors. So why do some people develop acute attack or why in the same patient only one eye develops an acute attack and the other eye does not? So again, as I said, the earlier diagram which I referred to that that patient, even though the anatomy might be the same, a millimeter difference in the ciliary body uh, position or the lens position could, could sort of predispose only one eye to an attack and the other eye would be all right. So it is said that why some patients develop acute attack and that is because it's a small eye. Eyes with acute attacks are smaller as compared to the uh, other eyes. So to summarize, angle closure is an anatomic disease of small eyes. Pupillary block is just one mechanism. The anatomic and physiologic changes of the iris in the choroid play a great role. Uh, we still don't know why some people develop a chronic disease and some develop acute attacks. There is also a fact that if there is no lens, there is no primary angle closure because the, the, the one organelle which sort of crowds the eye that you have taken off. So thank you very much for a very patient listening. Thank you, madam. Thank you once again. Thank you, Dr. Preeti. So we'll have our first speaker, Dr. Arup, will be speaking to us on neovascular glaucoma. Can I have my slides on the screen? Okay. Good afternoon, friends, and uh, thank you, Dr. Meena, for having me here. And I'll be talking to you on uh, neovascular glaucoma, nothing financial in uh, the contents of my presentation. In a way back, Duke Elder uh, described neovascular glaucoma as a disastrous condition with very poor uh, out eventual outcomes. He even reflected that any surgery done for neovascular glaucoma only exacerbates the condition and there are a lot of uh, post-operative complications. And finally, the patient may require a retrovalvular injection of alcohol or a cyclodiathermy, and enucleation being the final uh, surgical approach. However, since then, uh, we have uh, come a long way, and uh, this has been rendered possible because of the all-round developments that has occurred in the field of uh, ophthalmology, both diagnostics as well as therapeutics, as well as a better understanding of the pathophysiological pathways. So we are able to pick up uh, the condition at a much earlier uh, stage, and we are able to institute therapeutic, uh, uh, you know, uh, therap the, the treatment for these situations. Uh, we have anti vegfs available to us, and the surgical results are also definitely enhanced because of the presence of the anti vegfs and uh, anti-metabolites. Uh, this was one patient that we managed in a clinic uh, pre-treatment and post-treatment, and the patient seems to have done well. Well, I would not say that it is a hunky-dory situation for us. Because you know, I just happened to go through a review, art, a, an, an original article published from L.B. Prasad uh, Bhuvaneshwar uh, late last year, which showed that uh, in their cohort of patients, visual impairment and blindness was seen in 75 to 90 percent of the patients, and there's a huge visual burden and mor morbidity. Uh, only 7 to 20 percent of the patients showed some improvement in vision. Rest of the patients had downhill course. But they also uh, believed and they, they, comment, they, they concluded that this particular study supports the tradition and knowledge that early intervention definitely uh, has a much better result in the management of these situations. So in my presentation, I'm going to talk to you about our uh, philosophy and the approach that we take in managing this uh, uh, situation. Uh, this is a busy slide and I have no intention of describing uh, each and every content of this slide. This is just to tell you that all these conditions have one final common uh, pathway of uh, causing this uh, neovascular glaucoma. Because of retinal ischemia or hypoxia, 
there is a production of angiogenesis factors which migrate anteriorly and work on the uveal tissue and the angle and uh, other rel related structures in resulting in this condition. Uh, diabetes, central retinal vein occlusion and ocular ischemic syndrome, etc., account for about 75% of all these uh, you know, conditions uh, of all, pa all patients with neovascular glaucoma. So what here I would like to highlight is whenever we make a diagnosis uh, 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 as shown in this particular slide, we have to be on our guard, on our toes, and make sure that these patients are appropriately treated and followed up properly so that they don't go into the stage of uh, rubiosis. Uh, for the uh, um, ease of management, uh, we divide uh, the neovascular glaucoma condition in uh, three stages, rubiotic, secondary open angle glaucoma, and secondary angle closure glaucoma. Depending upon the presence of uh, the new vessels and the location of the new vessels, the, the level of the intraocular pressure and the status of the gonios and the status of the angle on gonioscopy. In the rubiotic stage, we should be able to pick up the new vessels uh, from the pupillary margin or in the angle. Sometimes they are uh, present in you know, both the uh, structures. So it is important to be able to pick up the etiology and the extent of the neovascular process because it helps us to prognosticate and tailor therapy to prevent further worsening of the situation. As I have described earlier, you know, there are a few conditions which are more aggressive than others. For example, ischemic CRVO. So once we diagnose this condition, you know, these patients have to be managed uh, on, a, on a war footing. Extent of the neovascular process as uh, uh, described by the level of intraocular pressure, uh, careful undilated examination of the iris, gonioscopy and angiography should also be performed. This gives us an idea about where exactly we stand as far as the neovascularization is uh, concerned. Now, uh, this slide shows you the natural course of uh, neovascular glaucoma, in which associated with changes in intraocular pressure and treatment priorities. Uh, as we'll see here, the panretinal photocoagulation and intravitreal anti-vagive injection forms the mainstay of therapy in rubiotic in, in stage one, and it is also the mainstay of treatment for patients in the stage two and stage three. Now, uh, early on, when uh, intravitreal uh, uh, anti-vagive agents were released, quite early, for first when it came to the country, we conducted a study looking into the efficacy of combining intravitreal bevacizuma monotherapy with PRP in early stages of neovascular glaucoma. We presented it in multiple forums, international forums, and we got a couple of best paper of the session award. This is quite early. So we looked into you know, the efficacy of combining IVB with same-day PRP in early stages of NVG, uh, primary outcome measure being regression of neovascularization of iris and angle. Secondary outcome measure was control of intraocular pressure. Uh, there are three modes of intervention, as I mentioned, isolated PRP, IVB monotherapy, and combined IVB and PRP. Now, looking into the time to NVA regression, we saw that it was at least in the combined group, uh, where IVB and PRP were uh, combined. And this is one of the patients in our uh, series where, uh, where you see the pre-injection and post-injection uh, appearance. Uh, looking into the effectiveness uh, on treatment of, uh, effectiveness of treatment on IOP control, we found out that in the combined group, the intraocular pressure drop was noticed in the first week, and it continued over two weeks and 12 weeks uh, uh, period. So today, uh, we, I mean, the, st the study we concluded that intravitreal bevacizumab monotherapy with PRP can be considered as a first-line option in managing early stages of neovascular glaucoma. The follow-up protocol has to be very, very stringent, and it depends upon the exact etiology of the disease at what stage you pick up the disease, the status of IOP control, and that treatment modality chosen. And it may vary from every one to two weeks to every two to, two to three months or up to one year. It is important to involve the primary care physician in the management of uh, neovascular glaucoma. And patient counseling also forms a very important component because patient needs to know about the recalcitrant nature of the disease and the unpredictability involved in the natural history of this disease. Patients should also be made aware of the signs and symptoms of uncontrolled intraocular pressure, and patients should be told about the importance of compliance, that even if they do well, they need to come back. You know, apparently if they do well, they need to come back for a regular checkup so that you know, the proper follow-up is done and appropriate treatment is instituted at the correct time. Uh, start, literature also showed the use of AFL fiber set for the treatment of NVG, but then I think, uh, I mean, uh, the further research is needed uh, to know the exact role of uh, this molecule. 
Now, when you move on to the secondary open ankle glaucoma, where the intraocular pressure is raised, medical treatment of intraocular pressure raised IOP has to be done. And it is usually uh, a combination of beta blockers, carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, and alpha agonists. Uh, one could also use a topical carbonic anhydrase uh, inhibitors, and, and uh, in a, it, could, it co could also be used systematically, particularly for children. There is a very controversial role for you know, prostaglandin analogs or pilocarpine we don't tend to use in uh, this situation. The inflammation should be controlled with topical steroids and cyclobrigics. Some, In spite of our best effort, if we don't pick up the patients early, and in certain situations, even if we make an early diagnosis, the treatment has to be rapidly escalated to maximum tolerated medical therapy in these situations. So moving on to the second angle closure glaucoma, where uh, the angle has closed by the, by the, because of the contraction of the neovascular gl glaucoma, uh, neovascular membrane, and the patient is already on medical treatment. Surgical treatment is called for, and uh, the surgery that we choose, basically the options are trabeculectomy with uh, either antimetabolites, valve shunt, and transcleural cyclophotocoagulation. Now, uh, again, I mean, this was an interesting study that was published uh, by uh, the LV Prasad Hyderabad group, published last year, which looked into the surgical outcomes and risk factors for trabeculectomy in this situation, and they identified certain risk factors. Uh, the etiology was important, and they found out that PDR was worse than CRV or ocular ischemic syndrome, and this was actually in conflict with the outcomes, uh, uh, the results of the various couple of other studies. They also found that increasing age was a, uh, was a significant risk factor. On the other hand, the, the previous papers, many other papers, you know, they found it was actually a better prognostic factor. The other risk factors included persistent and in new, vas uh, new vascular vas vascularization of the iris, higher number of pre-op anti of injections, and the delay in surgery. Interestingly, they did not find that uh, use or, not, not, or lack of use of anti-metabolites and anti uh, made any difference in the eventual outcomes uh, in, the, in the blep survival. This was another study uh, performed in Japan where the results seemed to be a little better. Uh, success rate at the end of one year was 90.2%, and uh, at the end of five years, it dropped to 67.7%. So uh, the same study, the Japanese study, identified risk factors, and they found out that a lower baseline IOP was associated with development of significant hypotony, and additional pass band vitrectomy was related to the insufficient IOP reduction. So friends, and I mean, when uh, we take up a patient for surgery, uh, we are doing Ahmed glaucoma well for quite some time. Then when the Adi device came in, uh, uh, we, uh, we started using these, but we had in our hands, it, was, it resulted in a lot of hypotony, and we subsequently again switched over to Ahmed glaucoma valve. And uh, there are, we haven't done any formal study as such, but you know, uh, there is uh, studies have shown a beneficial effects of adjuvant IVB injection on outcomes of Ahmed glaucoma valve in implantation in a similar situation. And cyclodestruction, of course, is usually usually reserved for you know a therapeutic option and the last resort when medical treatment has been unsuccessful patient's visual outcome has been poor. I think this is uh, the summary slide, and it is the most important slide in my presentation, highlighting the algorithm that uh, most of us follow in managing these situations. Uh, we basically ask three questions. Uh, does, uh, do we have a clear fundless view? If, it is, uh, if the answer is in the affirmative, then go ahead with PRP and intervitreal anti -VEGF. If the visual uh, view is, the, if, if the fundal view is not good, but the patient has a good prognosis, uh, the patient has to be uh, 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 operated upon to take, care, to take care of the media opacity, cataract surgery, or vitrectomy if the patient has vitreous hemorrhage, followed by PRP and intervital anti -VEGF. On the other hand, if the patient has a very uh, no, no clear fundless view and poor vision, then we ask, is the intraocular pressure normal? So in situations when the intraocular pressure is normal, the patient is followed up, and if it is elevated, then topical medications as I have, dis discuss as I have discussed earlier. And then as the patient is followed up, we ask, is the IOP controlled with medical treatment? If it is satisfactorily controlled, then the option, then we closely monitor the patient in, in the subsequent uh, period. Uh, if uh, the IOP is not controlled, but the visual prognosis is good, well, glaucoma drainage device uh, uh, is uh, called for, and uh, perioperative intravital anti vegf is also used. So these are the p cases where we, you know, the, the situations where you prefer this treatment modality is where you know where, where the risk trabeculectomy risk factors are present, and then we more or less um, take up these patients for the shunt uh, uh, surgeries. 
And if the visual prognosis is poor, think about we consider the transcleral cyclophotocoagulation. Uh, so, patient, uh, the friends, in conclusion, the neovascular glaucoma is a devastating and potentially site threatening type of secondary uh, glaucoma. And though the prognosis has have improved, but you know there are a lot of uh, issues that have to be kept in mind, which I've just discussed in my presentation to improve the prognosis and early diagnosis, appropriate treatment, and meticulous follow-up definitely is the way to go while tackling these situations. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Arvo. We'll have Dr. Sushmita speak to us on post-vitrectomy glaucomas. At the outset, thank you so much, Dr. Meena, for inviting me to the course and being part of it. Uh, can I have my slides, please? So, um, yeah. So, um, I'd be talking about the management of recalcitrant glaucomas following retinal surgeries. Is my slideshow moving? There's no slideshow in this because it won't move forward. So um, before uh, solving a problem, I think it's important that we understand what the problem is. You could have an early post-op IOP elevation or it could be later. Now early is most likely to have a persistent IOP increase for at least six weeks with SF6 or C3F8 gas or silicon oil. That's the commonest cause. Scleral buckles and encerclages if they're too tight and inflammation. Even inflammation though can cause low pressure also but if it's a lot of inflammation, sometimes it does go and clog the trabecular meshwork and it can be a problem. So if it's later, it's usually due to prolonged corticosteroid use and damage to the trabecular meshwork. So the risk factors for post-PPV glaucoma, in a case control study, they looked at people who had undergone PPV and those who did and did not undergo glau uh, develop glaucoma. So patients who required a glaucoma drainage device after VR surgery versus who underwent VR surgery without. So they found it was younger. They were more often men. They were people who had more interventions, who were treated with silicon oil, who had higher IOP one week after surgery, and who already had a history of glaucoma. So these are the kind of people to keep in mind that they are the ones at risk for raised pressures post-PPV surgery. So the broad Management principles are medical management. The acute rise sometimes may even require a buccal removal if it is very tight. Silicon oil or gas removal. A chronic rise would usually require surgery because they're not, they don't respond too well to medical management. So the usual treatment course in most of these are medical management is the first line, but the IP level and vision guide your plan. If it's less, and this is off the cuff of what most of us do, if it's less than 30 millimeters with good or moderate vision, we usually treat them medically and that's enough. If it's poor vision, then there's no point in flogging them all with medical treatment. We would do a limited DLCP. If it's uh, more than 30 millimeters with moderate vision, usually we would have surgery or to buy time, we might do a limited diode and poor vision usually lands up with a, with a di, uh, DLCP. And in these eyes, hypotony is more ominous. So remember, if you have low pressures post-PPV, that might actually trigger a redetachment. So be very, very careful that the pressures don't go too low. And usually some medication is required even after surgery. So what options of surgery do we have? A GDD is useful because they're often very high risk eyes. They have scarred conjunctiva. Uh, one study said that failure occurred in 20%, transient complications in 20%, and severe complications in another 20%. Inferior placement of the glaucoma device is important because it avoids migration of emulsified particles beneath the conjunctiva, and that causes more fibrosis. Tube placement in the sulcus is safer for cornea and easy after cataract surgery. If you have a pre-existing glaucoma, you might need to do a combined procedure at the same time, a PPV and a tube. 
Now, if you have a pre-existent end cerclage or a buckle, that makes it very difficult to dissect under the muscles and place a GDD in place of a, in the presence of a band. So I illustrate this 14-year-old boy who had lost one eye to a blast injury. The other eye had cataract surgery, recurrent RD, and had undergone PPV. The best vision was 624, IOP was 44 on maximum medications, and had very little money left. So at that point of time, uh, Dr. George actually gifted us some Adis to try. So he was one of the first that we did an Adi for. So we found it difficult to dissect under the muscle. Uh, since he had silicone oil, we were thinking of doing it on, um, uh, in the inferior quadrant. So this is the surgeon's view. And um, OK, I'll just move this forward. So as we dissected out, you'll see in the presence of a buckle, it's really, really hard to dissect under the muscle. But here, we didn't have a choice. Given a choice, I would do an AGV anyway. But since we didn't have a choice, and we kept searching for the muscle, because it was just one mass of fibrous tissue. So it does get to be a little uh, difficult. And finally, the muscle is isolated. We don't like doing this uh, without the, the muscle sheath and everything. But then with these scarred eyes, this is something that, that happens. And then now for the next muscle was another problem. Finally isolated both, pushed in the GDD inside, and actually pushed the plate behind the buckle. So uh, the GDD was actually very far back. So finally it went in. Now remember, this is the inferior quadrant. And this is what it looks like on the first post-op day with the tube in situ in the sulcus. Now contrast this to a patient who is diabetic who has TRD and PVR operated, but no visual gain. And the left eye has PVR. He's undergone PPV, encirclate, silicon oil, post-PPV intractable glaucoma, emulsified oil removed twice, extensively scarred conjunctiva, but the fellow does have 624 vision, and the pressure is 56. So for a patient like him, you look at this scarred conjunctiva. This is the buckle scene. You ask for the retina record so you know exactly where the band and the buckle is, so you plan what to do. And I realized there was no way that I'm going to struggle again. So this time, he could afford an AGV. And you, I'll just show you how easy it is to just push the AGV behind the buckle and then just drape the tube over the buckle and put it inside. So there the AGV goes in absolutely smoothly. And then you have a tube, which is just going to go in. And here you see. As the patient lies on the table, the silicon oil comes up right in front of the lens. So despite removal of silicon oil, you can have a lot of emulsified oil. So sure enough, this emulsified oil is a reverse hypopion, and the IOP is 12 on two medications, and so far is doing all right. So yet sometimes one is not enough. This is a patient in whom we did one, and then we had to do another. So sometimes he has an RD in one, and then he has an AGV in the other. And they're all uni-eyed, one-eyed, with nothing in the other. So they can be very, very tricky, too. Silicon oil can be very troublesome. This is a big bubble which needs removal before you even plan your glaucoma surgery. This has actually leaked out of the conjunctival incision. So that silicon oil, that silicon oil which has leaked out of the conjunctiva, even though there's no obvious erosion, so that's a little funny. But it's leaked out of the suture line. And this is a problem with superior tubes. Here you can see it's around the tube. It has decided to block it, and it is here. So you just wait and watch. Maybe he would, if this doesn't resolve, he'll require some sort of a ripcord ab internal to push the silicon away and out of the way. And uh, this is how the silicon oil emulsifies inside the tube. So you have a bubble around, and you have these silicon oil bubbles inside. So it's not that they get obstructed but they cause a lot of fibrosis. So we've learned our lesson, and silicon oil eyes are not given superior tubes anymore. So I'd like to show the journey of silicon oil. You can see this, which is just behind the cornea. And this on the UBM, which I was doing for just to see his angle and anything else, because it wasn't visible too much. So you see the silicon oil go in, and that's the journey to the trabecular meshwork, and then it goes goes out again. So we were so excited when we saw this because it tells us how the bubbles of silicon oil go into the anterior chamber, go into the angle, and then get right back. And that's how the trabecular meshwork is clogged. So sometimes tube migration is a problem. So this one-eyed uh, uh, man, young man again. 
and here you have a right post PPV glaucoma. Adi, but six months later, the tube migrated towards the pupil and had to be trimmed. We always trim them ab interno with two small incisions. Now, sometimes an excessively scarred conjunctiva may preclude a GDD, and you'd like to do something more. Remember, the limbus and ciliary body area is very, very distorted, especially in young patients. So when we do a TSCPC or a transcleral cyclophotocoagulation, always under transillumination, this is an easy round-the-counter pen torch, which we just shine above the cornea, and you can see the ciliary body lit up. And you can see how far it is from what you thought the limbus was. So this is where your TSCPC probe must go for you to do an effective laser for these patients. So to summarize, post-PPV or a scleral buccal glaucoma is a difficult entity to manage. Many times they are the only seeing eye and uh, glaucoma drainage device is usually required. For posterior segment pathology and glaucoma, combined PPV and GDD implantation may be a better alternative, but sometimes a guarded TSCPC is a less invasive and a safer option too. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sushmita, for that wonderful uh, presentation. I have a question for you. We have seen that in patients who have silicon oil-induced glaucoma, when, I mean, after we remove the silicon oil and keep the IOP under control, the field changes keep on progressing. Is it that we should lower the IOP further? Okay. Um, I, I'm not sure whether the silicon oil would be the reason for the field change. And if the fields are progressing, I would think that the intraocular pressure is possibly not enough for him. But uh, I haven't seen a field change after that, provided the pressure is where we want it to be. So that's something to look into. But, and I'm not sure whether the PPV would do anything to the field either. Uh, is it that the retinal laser that is done during PPV has taken off some RGCs and that's the problem? No, those are all stationary, okay. which is there before itself. Okay. But you see that this sometimes the field keeps on uh, with, with the pressures in, the, in where you think in the it low should teens. be in the low teens. Very, very unusual. We'll have to, I, I don't have an answer to why that should happen. One sec. Thank you. Thank you, Sushmita. We'll move on to our next uh, speaker. Dr. Sunita Dubey will deal with the very difficult subjects, the difficulties that are encountered in the diagnosis and management of uh, glaucoma in patients with high myopia. Uh, uh, at the outset, I would like to thank Dr. Meena for having me here. I'll be talking on difficulties in diagnosing and management of glaucoma in myopic eyes. So the association between myopia and glaucoma has long been recognized. While the two conditions coexist, there is often a diagnostic challenge to the clinician. As such, myopic discs are more predisposed to glaucoma because there is stretching and thinning of the lamina cribrosa, which is the primary site of damage and leads to decreased distance between the retrobulbar CSF space and the IOP compartment, resulting in steeper pressure gradient across the lamina cribrosa, causing more predisposition to glaucomatous optic neuropathy. Why it is difficult to detect glaucoma? Because glaucoma is assessed clinically by evaluation of optic nerve head and visual fields, and uneven expansion of the posterior globe wall leads to tilting of the disc and parapapillary changes, making the disc evaluation very challenging. Also, degenerative changes in myopia could lead to visual field defects that can mimic uh, those seen in glaucoma. Also, progressive myopia with progressive tilting of the disc, which often happens in children, may lead to difficulty in detecting progression of glaucoma on structure as well as functional assessment because of the progressive abnormality of the disc. Thinning of sclera and cornea will lower, with lower corneal hysteresis affect IOP measurements, therefore making the IOP estimation inaccurate. So evaluation of glaucoma and myopia requires a multimodal approach. So there, these are the morphological diversity of the optic nerve head, which includes tilting, cyclotorsion, myopic conus, parapapillary atrophy. And in high myopes, generally the disc is large, which, with large cup, and which mimics glaucoma. And also, it is not easy to interpret the neuroretinal rim correctly because of the shallow cupping and tilting. The prevalence of tilted disc is very 
high in patients with high myopia as compared to the normal population. And you see this exaggerated D-shaped optic nerve or oval optic nerve with one hemisphere of the disc more elevated than the contralateral half in case of tilted disc. And also the torsion is also very common where the rota there's rotation of the sagittal axis of the optic nerve beyond 15 degrees. So sometimes it gets rotated by almost uh, 180 degrees. So one has to identify all these morphological variations. And we are all aware of the alpha zone and beta zone uh, which are common in myopia. Beta zone is more common in glaucoma, uh, characterized by complete loss of RPE. Uh, with the advancement in OCT technology, now we are able to identify gamma zone or delta zone also. Gamma zone is the zone between optic nerve head margin and the Brooks membrane termination. So here you will see this scleral flange. And if there's no vascularization, it's called gamma zone. So this is the normal disc. This is glaucomatous disc with uh, beta zone and increased cupping and loss of neurotinal rim. And this is the myopic disc, which is large disc with shallow cupping and pale uh, neurotinal rim and myopic corners and with delta zone. Uh, as far as visual field analysis is con concerned, myopic retinopathy would lead to visual field defects, which can obscure the glaucomatous defect. However, one should remember that uh, myopic uh, field defects affect the area of blind spot due to parapapillary atrophy, as you can see here in this picture, and also central fixation due to involvement of macula, whereas the glaucomatous defects occur mostly in germs area or as nasal steps. So this is a differentiating point. And if the myopia, uh, in non-progressive myopia, if there's progression of the visual field, Despite stable macula, it may indicate glaucomatous progression. Uh, OCT may be generally fallacious in uh, myopia because these eyes are very large and the volume scans which are acquired with most of the OCTs have a depth focus of about two millimeter. So increased curvature of the posterior wall and increased axial length exceed this limit and therefore leading to segmentation errors. And it may not be possible to acquire the scan in, uh, uh, in one scan. No normative database is available for myopic population, so there is no age-matched comparisons available. So uh, segmentation errors in high myopia are caused by the temporal shift of blood vessels and causing temporal displacement of RNFL bundles due to scleral elongation. So you will see this fallacious defects uh, on the nasal RNFL the nasal RNFL will be thin, and the temporal RNFL will be fallaciously thick. So GCIPL thickness uh, is more useful and uh, more accurate if there's less deformation of macula. Again, you can see the red disease because of the temporal displacement of RNFL bundles in high myopia because of the high axial length. Let me take you to uh, a few cases. This is a high myopic male with axial length of 27 in the right eye and 27 um, in both the eyes with normal IOP. And you can see the torted and tilted disc. And uh, there are a lot of segmentation errors and the, uh, a lot of red defects here in the OCT which are not reliable. And if you look at the visual fields, it is more or less normal. So here you will rely on the visual fields. Uh, in the second case, Again, this patient had high myopia and he was diagnosed as advanced glaucoma in both eyes. And if you look at these uh, pictures, you see a lot extensive chorioretinal atrophy in both eyes and it is not possible to, um, yeah, to uh, you know, diagnose glaucoma based on the basis of um, optic disc alone. And you are not able to um, comment on the neuroretinal rim. And OCT, of course, is showing a lot of segmentation errors. OCT is not useful. And with the field defects, you can see the defects both because of glaucoma and myopia. Here you can see defects around the blind spot and also in the nasal step area. And in the left eye, the vision was less and mostly you see this defect around the blind spot. And uh, uh, over a period of time, there was progression of the defects uh, on the nasal side and progressing to the arcuate uh, in the right eye, which could be suggestive of the uh, progression because of glaucoma. So you have to correlate findings. 
The other case with high intraocular pressure, again, the discs were not uh, so clear. They were horizontally tilted and with inferior and inferotemporal PPA. And in both eyes, the visual field showed uh, superior defects, superior arco in the right eye and paracentral defects in the left eye. OCT, as I am emphasizing again and again, is not very conclusive in cases of myopia. So there's a lot of difficulties in diagnosis. Clinically, IOP is not always elevated in myopic patients. So look for IOP fluctuations because normal tension glaucoma may be more common in these patients. CCT should be checked to identify falsely low IOP measurements. And history of, it's important to elicit the history of refractive surgery because some of these patients may have undergone refractive surgeries leading to low CCT. Careful evaluation of ONH and be aware of uh, fallacious OCT findings. Glaucoma may progress quickly in these patients because of the labina cribrosa thinning, so regular follow-ups are essential and uh, uh, try to monitor all the parameters. Do not rely on color coding on OCT. Instead, compare the OCT data of patient's own baseline because you'll get the accurate findings in patient's own baseline and then you just follow up on the basis of baseline because you, there's no normative data available. And uh, if myopic maculopathy is not there, then assessment of macular measurements, which are not influenced by myopic thinning of uh, CPRNFL, have a superior diagnostic value in diagnosing or identifying changes in these patients. Early management of glaucoma is particularly important in this group as surgical management may be difficult and risky because of the altered scleral biomechanics as compared to the normal eyes. And also be very, very cautious while doing cat glaucoma surgeries because these eyes are more prone for hypotony because of the thinner and less rigid scleral wall. And uh, mitomycin C should be used with utmost caution in these patients as it can lead to hypotenuse maculopathy and disastrous complications. So to conclude, there are no hard and fast rules for diagnosis of these difficult cases. Treat each patient individually, taking into account the family history, optic nerve head changes, visual field defects, IOP, and CCT. And it's reasonable to err on the side of caution in these high-risk eyes. And every patient of uh, myopia is a glaucoma suspect unless proven otherwise. So do a very careful evaluation of these patients to rule out glaucoma. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Smanita, for a very nice talk. Till uh, Dr. Mina comes on the screen, I just have a question on your last, uh, the point that you mentioned, and uh, to err on the higher side uh, uh, for the safety of patient management. So what can you just elaborate on that? I mean, you mean to say that, you know, we should start, uh, we should be starting treatment if you're not sure about or the, the, the last sentence that I've used in your uh, presentation. So, uh, because myopic eyes are more predisposed towards glaucoma because there is thinning of the lamina cribrosa and the steeper gradient across the lamina cribrosa because of the thinner lamina cribrosa. So these eyes are uh, more predisposed and uh, the in most of these eyes, there is thinning of RNFL and uh, the corneal, central corneal thickness is also thin. So fallacious IOP recording can be there. And then discs is, are so abnormal that you are not able to judge the disc optic nerve. And you may not be able to monitor the progression in the cupping over a period of time because of the presence of parapapillary atrophy and you know, tilting uh, of the disc. And the visual field, if the myopic uh, retinopathy is progressive, then it can also uh, lead to some visual field changes because of the degenerative changes in the retina. So, but I had uh, shown the differences between the myopic visual fields and the glaucomatous visual fields, as glaucomatous visual fields are more common on the nasal side and arcuate area. So, and the OCT is not reliable at all, especially in high myopes because and the, uh, the discs are large and you're not able to get the accurate calculation circle. So I think all these, th therefore these eyes are more predisposed and of glaucoma can be often missed. So that is why, and the, since these eyes are more predisposed, so you have to be very, very careful and consider these eyes as glaucomatous and look carefully. If slightest suspicion is there, you have to have a stringent follow-up to rule out glaucoma.
And so I think that. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Su Sunita. I'll move on to one of the most relevant uh, topics in recalcitrant glaucomas in patients who have posterior segment pathologies, which is the IOP elevation that we see after intravitreal injection. In this era where the anti wedgev uh, injection or steroid injection has become the, the standard of care in the management of renal vascular pathologies, we need to be aware of the fact that the intraocular pressure elevation which can occur after intravitreal injection may occur in the immediate post-injection phase or it can be a sustained elevation of intraocular pressure. These are the common indications for which uh, anti wedgevs are given in any retinal practice. And if you look at the IOP elevation of the anti wedgev injection, it could be a prompt volume load related post-injection elevation or the transient IOP elevation in which the IOP increases sky high in the immediate post-injection phase and then returns back to normal without any treatment in about 30 to 60 minutes time. This is basically because of the volume overload. In contrast to that, we have a group of patients who develop a sustained increase in intraocular pressure because of various factors, some of which are known and some of which are unknown. And this sustained elevation of intraocular pressure could be defined as an IOP which is more than 25 millimeter of mercury or a 5 millimeter increase in intraocular pressure from the baseline value that the value we started with before giving the intravitreal injection or when there is a 5 millimeter difference between the, both the eyes. As we go through the stock, I will try to elaborate on the various mechanisms which are responsible for both the transient as well as the sustained elevation in intraocular pressure. So transient IOP elevation, the IOP may go as high as about 30s or even 40s, and uh, this increase in intraocular pressure is actually quite alarming because we are very worried that this transient elevation of the intraocular pressure could cause an aggravation of the ganglion cell layer, the optic nerve had damage in an eye which has already a compromised posterior segment. So we do not know whether routine paracentesis is necessary in all these patients or whether these patients need IOP monitoring till the pressure returns back to normal. This transient high IOP elevation could be associated with two very extremely rare but dreaded complication that is a blowout of a trabeculectomy blood or some of these patients when a lot of volume is injected into the vitreous cavity as a bolus can push the lens iris, hydrate the vitreous and push the lens iris drive from forward and there has been instances when this has resulted in an acute angle closure attack. If you look at the volume related transient elevation of intraocular pressure and its influence on the mean ocular pulse pressure, you can see that immediately in the post injection period, the mean ocular pulse pressure is reduced. Perfusion pressure is almost reduced to half of what we had in the pre-injection phase. But bear in mind that the optic nerve head has a very sorry about that. The optic nerve head had a very efficient blood flow autoregulatory mechanism. And when there is a reduction in the mean ocular pulse pressure, it is compensated by a reduction in the vascular resistance so that there is more blood flow occurring both to the optic nerve as well as to the peripapillary retina. If you look at the factors that have a correlation with the transient elevation and intraocular pressure, it is correlated significantly to the baseline IOP. It also increases more when more number of injections at a shorter duration of time has been given to the patient. A smaller axial length, which should definitely have a correlation, has been found to have no positive effect in various well constructed studies and when the interval between injections is reduced, the transient elevation of intraocular pressure is also more. There is a definite correlation between the need of the, the gauge of the needle that we are using for injection and the way you inject into the eye. And if you look at this video clipping, it shows that following the injection, when you have injected a bolus of the drug into the vitreous cavity, there is some reflux of fluids into the subconjunctival phase in space which is called the post-injection reflux. The, the post-injection reflux is a very important safety mechanism which helps the pressure from going up sky high and resulting in dreaded complications such as uh, a central renal artery occlusion. And most of us have the knee-jerk reflex of trying to prevent the fluid from coming into the subconjunctival space by pressing on the site of injection. Uh, this is something which should not be done. 
if you're using a smaller gauge needle, and if you're puncturing the globe and injecting deeply into the eye, the post-injection reflex will be less, and that can result in a very high transient elevation of pressure. This is actually a safety valve mechanism which should be encouraged in your subjects. The, if you're injecting by a tunnel entry into the vitreous cavity, or if you're injecting deep into the vitreous cavity, the PIR will be less. Prior massage of the globe to reduce the intraocular pressure has no effect. Ocular decompression does not have any effect. Prior administration of anti-glaucoma medication, either in topical or oral medication, has no effect in the transient elevation of intraocular pressure. But there is one method which can significantly lower the post-injection spike is to perform a paracentesis, which will ensure that adequate volume of the drug enters the vitreous cavity. And whenever you are dealing with a patient with, a pri with primary open-angle glaucoma who already has disc and optic nerve head changes, it is better to do a paracentesis each time you inject into the vitreous cavity. When you are doing a paracentesis routinely, we will be letting out about 210 microliters of aqueous, and this decreases IOP, prevents a post-injection reflex. It also ensures in this situation, although the post-PIR is a safety phenomena, in this situation when the eye is softened and there is no efflux of fluid from the eye, it ensures that whatever drug that you're injecting into the eye remains in the eye and becomes more efficacious. So routine prophylactic IOP lowering medications are not necessary. Frequent monitoring of IOP till normalization of pressure is also not necessary, except in patients who have a very compromised optic nerve head and very high uh, pressure spike. We look at the second aspect, which is a sustained elevation of intraocular pressure. And if you look at the sustained elevation of intraocular pressure, the definition is different in different studies. And if you look at the post ad hoc analysis of RCTs, where there is, there is definitely no definite criteria on what is sustained elevation of intraocular pressure. The incidence is about 26.1 percentage, but in real world settings, we rarely ever see a post sustained elevation of IOP following anti VEGF injection, and it's about 4.7 percentage. The various postulated risk factors for a sustained elevation of IOP are increased duration of treatment, more number of injections. Lesser interval between injections in patients with primary open-angle glaucoma. And there is no role for the type of drug that you inject, whether you inject bevacizumab, avastin, eplibacept, combacept, or uh, paginax, whatever you inject, there is no definite role on the type of drug and the protocol of injection. If you are following a treat and extend protocol or you're injecting monthly or you're a PRN basis, you're injecting, it has no role on the sustained elevation of IOP. When the duration of treatment and the number of injection increases, there is more chance for development of sustained elevation of intraocular pressure. Let us look at this example of a patient who has a non-ischemic central renal vein occlusion and macular edema. He received three injections of Lucentis. We started with the baseline IOP of 20 millimeter of mercury, and at the end of three injections, his IOP has gone out to 24. He feels are normal. Interpretation of the fields in patients with uh, Already a compromised retina and retinal pathology is difficult because your the glaucomatous changes as well as your retinal changes contribute to the fields that, that you bring out and it's very difficult to interpret. So the post uh, IVB spike of 24 millimeter was not associated with Geo seems to be very interested in connecting with me. Was associated with the normal static field and no RNFL changes, so we just kept this patient on follow-up. Let us look at another example where the IOP elevation from baseline was about 10 millimeter after the patient received three injections of Avastin. This patient had no history of family history of glaucoma and no history of prior treatment for glau glaucoma. His uh, central corneal thickness was 575 micron. There were no field or RNFL changes. We just put him on brinzolamide eye drops in the hope that his pressure would come down further. And also giving a topical carbonic anhydrase inhibitor may, may contribute to resolution of his macular edema. So he did well with that. Let us look at the mechanisms which are responsible. The most important mechanism is the microparticle obstruction of the trabecular meshwork and trabeculitis. This is... Uh, Excuse me. Excuse me. Uh, can you just convey the information? The sessions are still going on. 
and they have no business to you know start a uh, rehearsal for drums um, for the evening event please tell them i'm trying to contact them but they're not picking up the phone am i am i audible if i am audible we can let them enjoy and finish our work <laughs> the most important is the uh, progressive increase in the number of microparticles Hello. especially with bevacizumab if the whole time is longer we usually keep the bevacizumab injection stored for about 14 days and we injected it as and when the patient comes in and as the whole time increases the number of microparticles also increase and this can block the trabecular mesh work so also silicon leaching from the syringes that we use could also be responsible the anti vegf that we inject into the eye has a direct toxic effect on the trabecular meshwork cells by reducing the action of the nitric oxide synthetase and vegf is a substance which is actually produced by the schlems canal and when you inject and it is con it contributes to improving your facility of aqueous outflow and when you are injecting anti vegf into the eye you may block this uh, action of vegf and uh, thereby produce an increase in the intraocular pressure Chronic anti-VEGF administration has hence been ad associated with a reduction in the facility of aqueous outflow and also some amount of RNA fill thickness changes have been seen, especially yeah, in diabetic patients who receive multiple injections. So let us look at a patient who has an elevation from baseline and he again develops a rec recrudence of macular edema. And in this situation, what will you do? We will note the presence of sustained IOP elevation in the case sheet. We'll consider an AC tap paracentesis before injecting the next time. Continue stepping up his anti-glaucoma medication. Follow him up closely and see to it that each time he comes, every three monthly, you repeat his fields, OCT and RNFL changes. The second part of this presentation is on intravitreal steroids, which are very effective inflammatory mediators. The IOP elevation caused by steroids is actually misrepresented and and this very good drug is less, of, less commonly used. If you have a patient who has ocular risk factors, such as he has, a, he has primary open angle glaucoma or is a close relative of a, has a close family history of primary open angle glaucoma, he has type 1 diabetes, he is a high myope, older age group, or very young patients, and patients who have had prior steroid response, especially if the IOP spike has been more than 15 millimeters, these are all the ocular risk factors, and when we are giving steroid in intravitreal steroids in these patients, you should keep this in account. So a patient here is on a known case of primary open angle glaucoma on uh, Lumigan. He has a risen myocardial infarction where anti vegf injection is a no-no. Baseline IOP is 18 with uh, two injections of Osudrex. His pressure increases about eight millimeters around the baseline. So we step up his anti-glaucoma medications. So the incidence of uh, the most commonly used intravitreal steroid right now is dexamethasone. We give it in the form of dexamethasone implant. And post-implant high IOP spike do not take a single reading as a risk for elevated intraocular pressure. Keep your patient on follow-up. Look at the pressures with the other eye. See if correlate is pressures with the central corneal thickness. Look for asymmetry in the cup disc ratio and difference in pressures between both the eyes before coming to a conclusion that the steroid that you have injected is responsible for the elevation of intraocular pressure. Steroids causes elevation of intraocular pressure by a variety of mechanisms. It most important is stabilization of the lysosomal membranes. And uh, what it causes is that it causes accumulation of uh, glycosaminoglycans, which swells up and causes a biological edema and clogs the trabecular meshwork. In addition to that, the ejection of steroids can cause a stiffness, both of the trabecular meshwork cells, as well as the trabecular meshwork, reducing the facility of aqueous outflow. There is, sorry. There is inhibition of phagocytic properties of the endothelial cells, so your trabecular meshwork gets clogged up with debris and also decrease in the synthesis of prostaglandins, which is necessary for aqueous outflow from the trabecular space. Steroids produce some amount of cytotoxic effect on the trabecular meshwork cells. It causes increased release of LDH and CAS spaces. That it, probably it causes an ap increased apoptosis of the trabecular meshwork cells, which could again be responsible for your changes. So if your patient who has a IOP of more than eight millimeters above the baseline, again has recurrence of uh, macular edema, would you consider this 
a second implant in this patient. Studies have shown that you can definitely give a second implant because most of these situations are, can be medically controlled. And uh, there is no predictability as to which patients will develop a post-op spike after a steroid injection. Topical steroid, corticosteroid challenge test has very little role. You look for ocular and drug-related risk factors and decide whether your patient requires an anti-inflammatory mode of therapy to manage the VEGF, uh, the manage his, his uh, postural segment condition or VEGF is responsible and decide and inject accordingly. I thank you very much for your patient hearing. I have one more uh, short presentation on uh, This is also very relevant ah, because yes. peripheral exudative yeah, hemorrhagic chorioretinopathy in an elderly is very infrequently diagnosed, but commonly encountered condition and awareness of this condition, especially in your patients, majority of our elderly patients are on anticoagulants. They could be on a single anticoagulant or two anticoagulants. They could, almost everybody is on aspirin and clopilet these days. So in this group of patients who have peripheral exudative hemorrhagic chorioretinopathic changes, even subtle changes can develop massive suprachoroidal hemorrhage and angle closure. I'll show you two patients whom I saw in my practice. If you look at the causes of acute angle closure glau glaucoma, because of massive suprachoroidal hemorrhage, this is the literature review so far gives about 22 cases of various uh, causes ranging from age-related macular degeneration, anticoagulant intake, chronic myeloid leukemia, PCV. PHCR has not been so far reported, so I thought it would be interesting to put this uh, forward so that an awareness of this condition. It is a very frequently seen condition in a retina practice, and anybody, any one of our patients who is on anticoagulant therapy can, has these risk factors. This is an elderly man who was referred to me for management of an acute congestive attack. And you see that his chamber is very shallow, cornea is steamy. If you examine his fellow eye, you can see that he has areas of uh, subretinal hemorrhage and other changes suggest you of PHCR. This is at presentation and one week later, he underwent a drainage of the suprachoroidal blood. Most of these patients do very poorly and most of the time the eye ends in thysis, but drainage of suprachoroidal blood ensures that the patient is comfortable for some time into the post-operative period. This is another such patient. If you see his fellow eye, these are the classical changes of peripheral exudative hemorrhagic chorioretinopathy in the elderly. Small, subtle areas of subretinal hemorrhage with pigmentation, drusenoid material will be seen at the periphery, and most of these changes, patients will not have age-related macular degenerative changes in the fundus. In this patient also, we drained the suprachoroidal blood and he, she also became, I became thysical. The cut down is done, the choroid is exposed and uh, using a spatula, the suprachoroidal blood is leaked out. So friends, I thank you very much for your uh, patience in remain, remaining here with me. I hope the session was interesting and thank you very much for your patient attention. I'm closing the session. I thank my esteemed faculty for being here and for their excellent presentation. Thank you very much.